G'day everyone, and welcome back to Beckett. When we last left, we explored Daisy Starlight's house, investigated her son Peregrine's room, planted the bug that we needed to plant, and a whole lot of other cool things. So, now we are off. To where? I'm not sure. Dwarf girl, can I speak with you? Okay. The girl was small in height, but middle in years. Her fingers were stubby and warm. Excuse me, it's about Peregrine. <coughs> what do you know? Green friend, she said. <coughs> Where? <coughs> right, Beckett. <coughs> I mean, we are friends. We just fought. I think that's why he left. It was a terrible argument. I think he... She starts to cry. It's a wail that makes Beckett grimace. We were in love. <coughs> Did you go to the theatre with him the night before last? No, he didn't want to take me. That's why we fought. There was something else to be said. Ooh. Wait! I'm pregnant! Hello. Beckett runs his hand through his hair. Sees a number of hairs in his palm, then wipes them across the fabric of his trousers. To remove off. He considers the person at the end of the passage. Checks his watch and decides any response is not worth the effort. Okay. We have made a discovery. Beautiful. To her parents... Amy was detached. She lacked their values and found companions in those parts of society she was warned against. To her parents, Amy was lost. They made little effort to understand why she was who she was. Instead, they put it down to numbers. She was one of five, and it was five to one that one of their children should turn out this way. Which way? We all go our own way, go our own way. But the signposts keep us right. Don't stray from the path. Only badness will be found in the darkness. Beyond. She would sit by the pond. Tears in her eyes, wishing things were different. Wishing she were different, but never really meaning it. Barra grew from its markets. Before the factories, it was known for its fresh fish and imported fruits. Less so now, manufacturing port changed. As its workers left their wooden trawlers, buzz sources. Markets now serve capitalist desire for stuff. People come to spend money. What little they have, spending makes them feel better. So that's okay. Every so often, you'll see an upper. Amongst the weeks, and some lucky trader will spread the purchase. That means they close up shop early and turn home to spend time with them. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. Beckett comes in. The bustle helps to do this one. The bric a brac rustle. Sleeping memories. Ideas of those plans for wind spirit. Beckett has come to realize that his best thoughts aren't of his mate. He just catches them as they emerge from the ether. Cool. Ooh, popcorn, fresh paella. We've got meat. All types of meat. Meat for you. You want meat? Freshly made popcorn. 
popcorn stand. Go to the cinema show. Pay your money to bet. A long time ago, I sound the cellar headset. A car book came up with a popcorn. More money than it's worth. Placed a few pieces in his mouth and used his tongue to remove the shell. Take it face down. Oh, the weird. The meat stall collects flies. Question. Becca pushes his nails into the palm of his hands. Two bones from his skin. Flesh is good. Nearby a child wears for ice cream. When Becca was a child, he was fed raw bacon rind as a kid. He knew where bowls were sticking in his throat as he began. Old fingers pulled it up. Hey, that's just a bit creepy. Jesus. There are no flies here. The cheese stall, for whatever reason. The smell makes Becca feel underwatched. He reflects that he should shut up. It's not necessary. It's been days. Kicking at the fabric under his armpits, he pulls his shirt towards his nose. Training next snip. Okay, fine now. For now. We don't have to do that, making myself more than him. See what I wear. See them for the money they can Women and children are lost in the A multitude of factors. Swaying. As their prospective buyers should be doing them. Respected tags. Price is important. Child cries in the corner. His mother abandons him in search of a bargain. She will return, but for the moment she cares, he sees his pieces. The world is worth it. Sad. Yep. Moving on to the next part of the river. Pastor's stall is open. He knows Becca. There's history. The city's homeless collect the crap that they find on the streets and find corners to borrow market to sell it and give them the patient. The others come with open purses and throw away their coins. We sure laugh at this place since. Despite him, well, like it shows just the brick of rap, on occasion you find something. Alright, let's see what Castor has. Hello, Mr. Duncan. Nice to see you again. <coughs> Any word on the order? No. He's not here. Yeah, soon, said Castor. <coughs> Out of interest, do you have a customer with a wooden leg? Many. <coughs> hey, woman. Uh, you are the buyer, said Castor. <coughs> Just professional Castor. <laughs> of course. I think she was here yesterday. Do you want me to give a message? <coughs> no, it's not important. Test his insects. Here we go. All right. Forget. Cage is filled with exotic beetles, greens, blues, and gold. They writhe and struggle over each other, clicking and clacking. A metallic rainbow. Castor bears a silver grin, with eyes on Beckett. They know each other. He holds an assortment with delicate chains over his palm. Jailer, the ex and jailer and executioner are well suited man's death sword. How much? he inquires. Twelve notes, replied Castor. I'll take one. 
Suit turns to Beckett. The wife will love me for it. Caster reaches into the cage through a top hatch. The movement causes a riot of wings and heavy flight. A beautiful specimen is held between two slender fingers. Thick nails curling over their tips, he places the insect on the table and its wings retract. There is a small bowl filled with tubes. Beckett observes as Caster takes one and deftly unscrews its plastic lid, forcing a sizable amount of its clear liquid onto the underside of the insect, which he now holds upside down and near to his face. The attachment to the chain is executed with skill, and a powerful grip holds the bug and steel together until the clear, clear liquid had become a white solid, wings on or off, there is little hesitation off, replies Suit. Two quick snips and two membrana pieces fall gently to the table. The nexus is handed over and money is exchanged. Oh, okay. Interesting. So they're basically making emphasis out of this. Creepy. <laughs> All right, next part of the marquee. Ooh, some butterfly. Butterfly key. Special. I don't. Great coffee, taste of cakes, all that jazz. Right this way. The Butterfly Keys Cafe holds memories for Beckett. Take a moment. Reflect. Step inside. He picks up the dirt under his nails and wipes his hand across his trial. Move on. The future is A discolored carpet within a ring of wood. All worn out. All worn and out. Bury the lust cart discarded or left. The man was worn. He is a great machine, an irony. He's looking here for the best. Rick a brand. Beckett spots a few items that would not be out of place in these and Starlight's house. Meaningless junk. Projected values. Rates. Unwanted feelings. Unwanted. Unwanted items sold for money in the end of the world. Then so many wanted items. Alright, into the cafe we go. I really do like the way this game's put together. The butterfly keys has been in Barris since better days. Its management hasn't changed. Holding onto a relic from their past. Its teas draw crowds and keeps them away. Amy would order a spiced apple, while Beckett kept to gunpowder. He recalls her smile as she inhaled its scent and brought the cup to her lips. Kiss her lips again. Beckett takes a moment and clears his head. He needs to consider the present without disruption from the past. Interference. But it's one of the few places Beckett has left. There's a clarity here inside. Alright. Keep watch. He sits with a pen and a writing pad, scanning the room for inspiration and hurriedly transferring his observations, subconscious mix, to paper. 
He hasn't spotted Beckett. It's only a matter of time until he's woven into his story. Mm. Coffee drinkers, friends united by shared views and ethical similarities, are gathered and openly enthusiastically in the, openly enthusiastic in their discussions. Catching eyes and minds with their ideas, Beckett isn't interested in their words. They are of no consequence. Ah, lovers. Two men touching fingers, sharing a mutual love in their eyes. One whispers to the other, and the pair laugh and dream of future moments. Old women, three old ladies, sit drinking tea on comfortable chairs. China teapots and cups strained with red lipstick. And the brush of tongue. On the wall behind is a living print. Vibrant blues, purples, and yellows shift delicately as a hundred butterflies tug against the hardest, the hard set glue that holds them against the canvas. These posters last a month at best, collectively, just shy of a decade. The women are in their eighties, collectively, just shy of a quarter millennium. They talk about the past and present, never the future. Okay. Hi there, staff. Can I help you? Hmm. If you have any seats for free, I'll be over to take your order. Mm -hmm. Cool, said the boy. At one point, the use of the word cool would have been in fashion. This boy with acne face is obviously operating on the fringe. Either that, or he's ignorantly out of touch. <coughs> Kill. <coughs> All right. We taking the seat yet? No. Mm. That looks like an empty seat. Perfect. Menu. Gunpowder conspiracies. Beckett takes the menu. And from its centre falls a single printed page. It's a rant in typed ink. Something about a war that never happened. And a conspiracy in the city. We're all wanting answers. Who cares if the answers we get are wrong? Beckett places a sheet in front of him, removes the pen from his jacket, click, and jots down his own thoughts on its reverse. Somewhere along the way he orders and receives a gunpowder tea, but he has no recollection of this. The boy is on prescription antipsychotics, on referral to the reality principle. His mother has this down as the soft paranoia. Find out more. Paragon works at a building site with his uncle, Arnold Greyhound. His mother believed him to have friends there. Go speak with him. The boy has a fascination for Monument Park and likes collecting flowers. Mm, he may be there. He went to the theatre last night. The night before last, the ticket suggests Peregrine was with someone else. Who was this? This is all very weird. Let's just say the depression was always there. creepy
way they're doing the, the blending. Shame it. Smidge quicker. I don't really want to click in case we miss something here. That's creepy. <laughs> really cool the way they've done that. Speed up. Beckett couldn't understand, but understand his temperament and tried desperately to connect with Amy when she was taken by its ebbs and flows. He was cut from a different cloth. To him, life could be a heavy burden. It could slow you down. It could make you angry and frustrated. But it was manageable. He'd found a way to lock up all his emotions and observe them from that outside activity. At arm's length, looking outside objectively at arm's length. As a child, Beckett had overcome his fear of insects by exposure. He did the same with emotions. He keep he kept yeah, he kept them in boxes near his bed. He would force himself to look, to examine, to understand. Any unknown breeds fear. He was told, by whom it doesn't matter, a friend of his father's, no doubt. Yes, sir. He was more like his father than he cared to admit. He grew up believing his father to be emotionally retired. His mother would wipe away tears from through words read from 
flipping the pages while this old man would listen to the radio's constant stream, laughing at tales of misfortune and coughing heavily into a discoloured handkerchief, red speckles seeping into the fabric. A vision in red. Blink. They were all dead. Hospital. Okay. Ticket machine. The ticket machines were gifted by the city as it upgrades those used in its antiquated underground transport system. Can I help you, receptionist? Cool. Uh, mother and child. The woman leans close to her child. He has a bandage wrapped around his head, a comic book in his hands. The woman notices Beckett's attention and returns a sympathetic smile. Lady and Rabbit. An old woman sits with a rabbit in a cage. The creature is backed into the corner. He is flat. He senses only bad things to come. Bleeding arms. The man scratches his arms. Small bubbles of blood form as his nails dig away at the flesh. Flakes of skin delicately fall to the floor. Hmm. Pregnant woman. The woman is approaching old age. Her face expresses both hope and worry. Hands rest on bloated stomach. Inside the future forms. The wheels of fate set in motion. Unknown. Unhealthy couple. Wheezing mountains of flesh. Sweaty hands rubbing against a strained fabric. Besides him, a diminutive figure, she is a quarter of his organic mass. She sits with a ticket clasped in her hand and a look of terror in her eyes. A pamphlet. City Publishing Corp. The Dead Don't Care. An instruction manual for the living. These leaflets were standard issue by the city. Within its pages was a series of nonsense designed to both confuse and calm in equal measures. The two being happy bad fellows. If the copywriter is worth his salt. Very cool. Alright. Let's see what the uh, receptionist wants. Can I help you? <coughs> of AC Reality Principle. Please take a ticket. Okay. Under the hiss and between frequencies there are words. You don't know their orders until you've carried them out. Okay. Grab a seat. Beckett can't help but watch as the man scratches into his flesh. The skin breaking under his fingers, making way for a slight trickle of blood. <coughs> Can you see them? <coughs> I'm not sure. I just don't let them inside. Once they're in, they never come out. We regret to inform you that due to underfunding, understaffing and undertaking, your wait might be longer than advertised. Please retreat into your own imaginations for entertainment until your number is called. heavy theme of insects in this game. Okay, another insect. Dead cat with insects. We're here not because of our choosing. Everyone remembers the shooting. No one remembers the brainwashing. Testimony was obtained from the children. They used memory tools, time-controlled suggestion machines, a 
constructing system worlds. We watch in wonder as the magpie pulls out the squirrel's eye. Insects crawl deep under our skin as experiments on the human mind. Take a medical instrument shaped like an ice pick, insert it through the top of the patient's eye socket, and swish it back and forth, severing a portion of the frontal lobes from the rest of the brain. Oh, cool, frontal lobotomy. Nice. The war never happened, they say. The war was never, <laughs> the war never happened. Only then do we realize the beauty of In the past, we did more damage than we do now. But the point I want to make is that the damage done by the illness is so much more disabling than the damage the present day operations do. We all forget. We are all forgotten. It's just a matter of time. Patient 3107, you can go through now. That was the number printed on the ticket. Huzzah! We finally get to see the reality principle. Over there. Very creepy. Two nurses lost in conversation. Beckett has no desire to intervene. Are you lost, dear? I'm looking for the reality principal's office. Of course, just keep going on in the direction you're going and you'll get there, she said. <coughs> Ain't you? and nurse. The person in the wheelchair is old beyond years. They are wrapped in a blanket showing life through yellow in their eyes and a faint wheeze as air pulls into their lungs via tubes in their nose. This is Frankie and our little guinea pig. Remarkable when the... When, remarkable really that Frankie is still with us. Most people don't last more than a few weeks under the treatment. But Frankie has managed several years of... Of course there's no room for Frankie here really the wards are taken up with the younger people so we just keep the poor old sod out here in the passages it's fine Frankie doesn't mind do you dear Frankie's eyes start staring at Beckett lips starting to form shapes grey tongue popping in and out oh look I think Frankie's going to say something Both Beckett and the nurse live near the smell of piss and stale breath is overwhelming three words don't trust her cool Oh, a poster. We should check that. Let me out. Okay. This is not healthy. Mop boy. Okay. Check the posters out. electric shock treatment
excuse me. The boy turns to Beckett. He is sweating with effort. <coughs> I'm looking for the reality principles office. Uh, I. Uh, the boy stops. He shuts his eyes. Takes a breath. Gestures to his right and nods. <coughs> Ain't you? Enter your patient number. Don't remember. It's three something. Everyone. Zero zero seven. Uh oh. The reality principle is hard to describe. Whatever, you look away from it, or even blink, you forget its features. Any other thing, though, young or old, it's impossible to say. But there is a distinct familiarity. The eyes feel wholesome, the children are delicate. The voice feels masterful, and informed. Gentlemen, and understand. Take full and full of eyes. So, how are you today? <laughs> I'm here about Peregrine Starlight. Of course you are. Listen to the sound of my voice. What you are observing, your brain. It's alive, constantly processing. A reality machine, as it were. I am going to ask you a series of questions. Try pressing a few buttons. If your sound of mind, these questions won't get to you. Now let's begin. Try thinking left. Now try thinking right. You're natural. Are you sexually active? sits back in its chair. Beckett is left confused and wipes the sweat from his brow. In his coat sleeve, he watches as the reality, reality principle reaches across his right hand. 
Go on, there are moves on equal. They place it on the desk in front of me. Pick it. Pamphlet. Never to vote for Peppy, stop paranoia. Okay. I'll let you folks read that. <coughs> All very interesting. I hope it helps. <coughs> Can you tell me about Peregrine Starlight and Daisy Starlight being treated? Becky, I can't tell you that. <coughs> Peregrine is missing. I don't. He doesn't have his pills. The city will miss his pills. They already know. I see. <coughs> is he dangerous? Not in any physical sense. But reality is a precious thing. You must be bored. I have a few leads. I'm sure you have. Now, if you could please lie down on the consultation bed, and shall continue. Oh man, do we go or do we... No thanks, I've got everything I need. That was really weird. They would never talk about those days. Happy days for Beckett. Amy would scream if Beckett suggested it or ventured into, his unfam into this unfamiliar territory. She tore down and ripped up any posters that reminded Beckett. Er, uh, that reminded Beckett. Beckett kept one. He kept it folded in a box that he locked, with numbers that Amy would never remember. Over time, the truth of how they met, how they courted, how they fell in love, it all became a reenactment, a performance that would bend to the winds of its actors and audience. An interactive drama where every choice distorts reality, questioning the way things were and presenting the way they should have been, or is it the way things could have been? Amy is long gone, now taken from this world. Now Beckett keeps the poster behind glass. In a dark corner, everything stays locked away. It's a confirmation of the past and the sole reason for his future. He keeps Amy alive by living. <laughs> that is so creepy. Anyway... I'm going to uh, I'm going to leave this episode here, folks. Uh, when we return, we will see what happens next. It sounds like we're at a construction site. So I want to thank you all for joining me. If you enjoyed this episode of Beckett, please remember to leave a like, thumbs up, all that good stuff. If you're new to the channel and want to see more Beckett, please subscribe and hit the notification icon. And comments. Please feel free to leave comments because your support is greatly appreciated. Anyway, thanks again for joining us. And until next time, ladies. Later.